Welcome back to beautiful downtown Hudson here at Hudson Appliance for another episode of Wicked Good Food. I'm your host Matt Williams and today we're doing a little bit of chicken fried. So we're going to make chicken fried steak, we're going to make chicken fried chicken, we're going to make a sausage gravy, we're going to make a country gravy, and we're going to make some mashed potatoes. First thing we're going to get going on is the mashed potatoes. I have some water over here, I'm going to salt it pretty liberally, and I have some potatoes. Red potatoes, stick them right in, you clean them up a little bit. You don't want to make mud, you know, when you put dirty potatoes in your water. And I'm going to crank this up. Now you'll be amazed at how quickly this water will start to boil on these induction stove tops. It's, it always blows my mind. So chicken fried. So I was at school today and I was talking to a couple of my students. I said, hey, you have any idea what chicken fried is? And they're like, that's a Zach Brown song. I'm like, All right, fair enough. It's a good song. But do you know what it is? They didn't know what it was. I was kind of bummed out. <clears throat> it's one of my favorite things to eat. My cousin, RJ Bushy, it's one of his favorite things to eat. I can remember getting phone calls to go up to his house to make it. So what do you want for dinner? He's like, you know what I want for dinner. I want chicken fried steak. So that's what we're gonna make today. My first experience ever with chicken fried steak was at a restaurant I worked at in Dallas. The chef had some deep southern roots and I remember taking my first tour and there were actually two restaurants they came out of the same kitchen and I didn't work out of the like quick service one and I saw all the tickets and they kept saying CFS and CFC. And I remember asking and saying, what, what is that? Because they were yelling back and forth, you know, ordering two CFS, but it was chicken fried steak and chicken fried chicken. <clears throat> so chicken fried steak is a way that you serve relatively inexpensive steak. I have a round steak here. It's not tender. This is not something you'd want to throw on the grill and then try to chew. This is something you're going to end up just slicing real thin. You're going to do something to it to make it be more tender. So that's what we're going to do here. It's a relatively cheap piece of steak that you bread like you'd bread fried chicken, more or less. And so chicken fried chicken is the same thing, except it's a boneless piece of chicken. So we're going to start with the steak. <clears throat> So beef is expensive. Right now, beef is just in a trend of being very expensive. Even this was more than I wanted to pay for it, but it's a decent piece. It's relatively lean. I'm holding on to some fat on the side here. I'm going to trim this off real quick. And any, anything that might kind of get in your way that you have to chew. Nobody wants to have to spit out any gristle or anything. So I'm gonna try to stick the tip of my knife underneath and just kind of clean it up a little bit. <clears throat> All right, so now this piece of beef, oops, a little more there. This piece of beef is a little thick. All right, if I were to try to cook this, it's just gonna, by the time it's cooked, it's, it's gonna be super chewy. So what I'm gonna do is actually make the whole thing a little thinner. I'm going to lay it here, and I chose this piece because I could do this with it. I'm going to lay it here, I'm going to keep my hand flat, and I'm going to go through and just cut this right in half. I'm trying to cut straight through it. And so you get two relatively equal sized pieces. <clears throat> There's a little bit of um, sinew that runs through here. I'm not going to go ahead and cut all that out just because it's going to end up messing up my piece of meat. So at this point, I have two pieces of meat that still aren't very tender. So you've got a couple different options to try to make it tender. One of them <clears throat> is to take it and pound the heck out of it, which you can totally do. So I've got, I've got a whole family here of meat mallets from this tiny little one that doesn't really do any good. And these are sharp. This is more like a weapon. I wouldn't want to use this with these really sharp ends because it's going to tear right through the meat, and I don't want to do that. Both of these two are pretty good. I like this one better because it's a little heavier. <clears throat> but what you do is, I'm going to move this so it doesn't make a lot of noise, is take and just, and you can see as it's flattening it and the little bits of, um, the little sharp parts are actually going in and breaking down the meat. So this is making it more tender. It might sound a little weird, but this is like pre-chewing it for you. This is doing the action that your teeth have to do to get it into something that's digestible. So go through. So that's one way. Another way is to take a fork and just go like this. A whole bunch of times. And what you're doing is you're going through and you're breaking the muscle fibers up. And you're actually gonna make it more tender. 
Who wants to do that? That's when you get this machine. So this is a needler. And what happens is when you push down, these needles pop out. So when I put this into the meat, these needles are going to go through and they're going to actually cut the meat. And if you look at it, you can see that they're flat. I don't know if you can see that, but I'm going to put the flat side so it's actually going against the grain. And I've just put hundreds and hundreds of holes in here. I'm going to flip it over, do the same thing the other way. And if you want, you can go back the other way. You can actually do this too much. If you do it too much, your piece of meat's going to fall all apart. But this should be pretty tender. I like to go one direction, the other direction, flip it over, do both directions. So I'm going to hit that side there, just so that we're consistent in thickness. So now those pieces of meat have actually spread out. They've gotten a little bit bigger. There's a little bit more surface area. <clears throat> All right, so this is a great tool, but it's really important you clean it very well. It's raw meat. <clears throat> make sure you clean these. They're little stainless steel blades. They're not very hard to clean, but you want to make sure that you get in between here because nobody wants to grab this the next time and find little bits of dried out beef on there. All right, so now <clears throat> we've got our steak that's tenderized. Now this is a piece of meat that we are going to be able to cook and we're going to be able to eat and chew without chewing all day long. So it's actually a really, really simple process. We're going to start out with some flour, which I have right here. Let me move that out of the way. And we're going to season this with some salt and pepper, but we're going to take actually a really quick break. I need to wash my hands before I... All right, so now I've got some clean hands. So. Our steaks are nice and tender. My Aunt Pam, who's nice enough to be here working the camera, just asked me, said, can you use cube steak? And I forgot to mention that. So this is kind of what cube steak is. Cube steak goes through a process where they tenderize the heck out of usually a round steak, out of a steak that is not super tender. So the round actually comes from the leg. Think about like the thigh of a cow. A thigh is a muscle that works a lot. As it works a lot, think about your muscles. If you're a bodybuilder, your muscles get bigger. So they're less tender that way. But that's why we tenderize them. That's why we do things like this. So here I've got flour. I'm going to season it pretty liberally with salt. And that might seem like a whole heck of a lot of salt, but think about how thin the layer of flour that's going to be on here is going to be. We're going to use some fresh ground black pepper. <clears throat> All right, that should be good there. So I'm just going to use my whisk here and whisk this together. All right, so, and it might seem weird, but taste your flour. Salty, peppery, exactly how it should be. I'm looking at our potatoes over here, and they're boiling away. I'm going to turn the heat down just a little bit. I don't want them to boil too crazy. You notice that I threw the potatoes in with their skins on. I did that on purpose, and I actually chose smaller red potatoes because I want to cook them with their skin on. The skin actually keeps water from going into the potatoes. If you take your potatoes from mashed potatoes and you cut them up or you peel them first, what's going to happen is you're going to lose potato flavor into your water and you're going to gain water, which doesn't have much flavor, which will make it a little bit more difficult for you to add whatever you're going to add to it, whether that's butter or sour cream or whatever the fats you're going to add, because you end up with a watery potato. So, Oftentimes when I'm making mashed potatoes, when I want to make a really nice mashed potato, I'll do my potatoes whole and then peel them after. But with the red skin potato, these have a nice thin skin. They're just going to get smashed. We'll call them smashed potatoes with the skins on there. So the reason I turned it down is I don't want them to, to uh, boil so hard that the skins start to tear a little bit and we get water into our potatoes. Not a big deal, but a personal preference thing. And I think, you know, when I make mashed potatoes, I want them to taste like potato in butter, in cheese, and sour cream, and whatever else, dairy fat I choose. All right. Now, we're going to make an egg wash next. So we're going to take a couple eggs here. And I'm just going to crack them into this bowl. So if you want, you can do the old one-handed egg cracker. If you think you're good, then you've got to do both of them at the same time. 
That's what happens when you get to do like 30 dozen eggs. You sit here with a 15 dozen box on this side and a 15 dozen box and you just crack like crazy. Or you become the teacher and you have your students do it. That's my preferred method. All right, so I'm gonna use the same whisk because I'm not worried about cross-contaminating anything here. Beat these up, I'm gonna add some milk. And if you don't happen to have milk, you can use water. You can throw in some cream, it doesn't matter. Milk has a little more flavor than water, which is why we use it. <clears throat> okay, so at this point, I am almost ready to start my, my country fried steak or my chicken fried steak. So what I want to do is I want to turn my burner up a little bit because you want your oil to be hot. So I have a little bit of vegetable oil in here, just a little bit more than you need to cover the bottom of the pan. So rather than make a mess of myself, I'm going to start using my tongs here. And I'm going to take one of my steaks, I'm going to dredge it in my seasoned flour. Now if I wasn't doing a cooking show and I was standing right next to my um, sink at home and I had a bunch of these to do, I would have one hand that all I would do is I would do the flour and one hand that would just do the egg. If you use the same hand for both, you end up breading the steak, but you end up breading your fingers too and you end up with like fingers that are so wide you can't close them together. All right, so we'll get it really well coated. Shake off a little bit of the excess. We'll stick it right into our egg wash here. Drip off some extra, and then we'll go right back into our flour. Once again, you want to coat it really well, so move it around, flip it around. <clears throat> Any spots you might knock it off with the tongs. Go ahead and kind of redredge. Whoop, oh, there's another spot. There's another spot. Now I just want to see. Yeah, we're not quite there yet. You know what? So I'm going to turn this up a little bit more. But that's like I, I can't say enough about these, these induction ranges. They're awesome because it, it's all magnets and it happens so quickly. It, causes, it actually causes friction within the pan and it warms up. So I bet this is ready now. There you go. Good amount of bubbling. If you put it in a pan that's too cold, what will happen is you'll end up with um, your flour working like a sponge almost and absorbing some of this grease some of the oil that we have in there and we don't want that because this even though this is going to be coated and fried this is not should not be a greasy dish you know, when you're all done you should have a nice crisp crust on the outside that shouldn't seem greasy all right so back into our flour again with our other piece and coat it real well the more you do, the more you'll get little bits of your egg that get stuck in your flour, and the more you'll get these little like kernels of flour that stick, which I think makes it kind of cool. All right, so we've got two pieces of steak in there. It doesn't take very long. Depending on how thick it is, it could be three or four minutes aside. You want to get a good uniform crust. We're going to take a quick break. I'm going to clean this up. We'll let this cook. I'll show you when, after we flip it what it looks like, and then we'll get working on what's going to be next. All right, so we're getting a nice crust on this steak, so we're ready to flip it over. A good indicator of when you're ready to flip, too, is you'll see some juices, some red juices kind of coming up from the other side of the steak. So we're going to leave that there for a minute. It's almost done. It won't take quite as long on the other side. And then here we go with one of these monster chicken breasts. Imagine the size of the chicken that this must have come from. It's actually kind of crazy. But what I'm going to do is trim it down a little bit. So right in the middle between these two breasts, you can see there's this little piece of the spot where the cartilage and the bone goes. We want to cut that off. That's one of those things you're in a restaurant eating something made out of chicken breast and you have this moment of like, what the heck is that? <coughs> All right. So I don't think I'm going to need both of these, so I'm going to move one of them over here. And the same thing with my chicken breast. I'm going to take it, 
and I'm going to cut it. But this time I'm going to try to get three pieces out of this. So we'll do the first piece. About like that. We'll do our next piece. About like that. Now, chicken breast, there's a little bloodline in there. We'll pull that out. Chicken breast is not nearly as tough as this steak is. So we don't need to beat it. We're not going to knife it. We are going to hit it with our mallet a little bit just to get it so it's consistent in size. Although I did a pretty good job here. But there's a high spot there and there's a high spot here. So I'm going to grab my mallet here. Now you'll see the mallet has this part here that has spikes. It also has a flat side. For the chicken, I'm just going to use a flat side. Because like I said, I'm not looking to beat it up. I just want to make it consistent in size. I just always just feel it with my hand to look for any high spots. Yeah, there's a big high spot here. A good little trick is you can wrap your, uh, put some plastic cracks over your chicken, especially if you're doing a bunch of it. That way you don't splash chicken all over the place. Perfect. All right, I need to wash my hands again. I'm gonna wash my hands. I'm gonna get this out of this pan so we don't overcook it. And then we'll get back and we'll make our chicken fried steak. All right, so I pulled our steak out. I put it on a rack in our warming oven behind me. It set it about 200 degrees just to keep it warm. I don't wanna cook it too much more, but it's all right to cook a little bit ahead of time. So our next step actually is we're gonna make our country gravy. So country gravy is essentially just using the pan drippings. So there's, if you look here, there's a little bit too much fat. I don't want all that fat, but I want all those little chunky bits there. So I'm gonna drain off a little bit of it. That should be good. And so now I'm gonna add flour to this. I'm going to add the same flour that we dredged it in. That should be plenty. And I just want to stir this around. And I had just turned my heat back on. It's really low. So I, I can turn it up a little bit more. And what we want to do here is, you've seen me make roux before. So the goal here is we're, we're essentially making a roux. We have some fat that was in our pan that was a vegetable oil that's now been seasoned with all the flour from the breading and a little bit of egg in there and a little bit of beef juices. And we added some flour to it. And the flour is getting all coated with that oil. So that's going to make our thickener. So we want this to cook a good four or five minutes. So this is a really, really simple gravy. Once again, this is a really inexpensive dish to make. This is a way to stretch some steak. Right? So you get this steak by breading it, it ends up being almost twice the amount you had. So it seems like it's a bigger portion than it actually is. And we're using what otherwise would be waste right here in our pan to make what's going to be our gravy. So I'm going to move it off the heat just for a moment. We'll get rid of this. And I have milk that I'm going to add. So whenever you're working with a roux, you've probably heard me say it before, but you want to have a cold liquid and a warm roux or warm liquid in a cold roux, but they can't both be hot. Otherwise, it'll instantly thicken and you end up with a bunch of roux balls. All right, so now I'm gonna add my roux, my milk right to this and mix it really well. And so now we've got all these chunks in there. I'm gonna move it back to our heat. And you can see how much it's already started to thicken. So I'm gonna add the rest of my milk I'm a big fan of black pepper in my gravy. So I'm going to put a bunch of fresh ground black pepper. Stir this around. So this will come to its total full thickness as soon as it comes to a simmer. And that's just about where we are. I like my fried steak gravy to be thick. This might be a little bit thick, so I'll narrow it. I'll thin it out with a little bit of milk. But we're going to take another quick break. All 
All right, so I just poked one of our potatoes. You can see here as I poke it, stick my fork pretty far in, they fall right out. These potatoes are done. So I'm gonna shut the heat off. I'll drain them in a second. They're not gonna get overcooked. They're not gonna get hurt by sitting there for another couple minutes. So now we're on to our country fried chicken. Our chicken fried chicken. So it's different than fried chicken because it doesn't have a bone in it and it doesn't have the skin on it. But essentially it's fried chicken. But I'm gonna take the piece of chicken, same thing. We're gonna take it and dredge it in the flour. Flip it over. Get it really well in the flour. Really well covered in the flour, that is. Get it in our egg wash. This is the exact same flour, the exact same egg wash I used for the beef. I'm not worried about that cross-contamination here. If somebody had a problem with beef, or somebody had a problem with chicken, then I would switch them up and use separate ones. But I like to make things efficient, I like to make them easy when I can. All right, so now we'll bang some excess flour off of here and drop it into our pan, which good. It looks like it's hot enough, perfect. And we'll get another piece of chicken here and do the same thing. I don't think all three of these are gonna fit. So we'll just do two. So I think I already said it, but I have the chicken in the warming oven. I mean the beef in a warming oven. So if I were making this for a crowd, this is exactly what I would do. I would use one or two pans, keep making it, put it in the warming oven. You know, you don't want to do it too far in advance, but if, you're, if you start half an hour before you're going to serve, that's fine. It'll hold up fine. But think about any meat that you would eat, whether it be chicken or it's beef. It's, if it sits around for a while, it gets a little tough, gets a little chewy. So I'll coat this guy really well. So now you can actually see on the side of this chicken here, you can see some of these little bits of flour sticking like right in there. So that's the crunchies. Like if you go to KFC, you get these little crunchies on the chicken. That's what that is. It's flour that's kind of mixed with some of the juices and some of the eggs and other things. All right, so then we'll take this guy, pop it right in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and drain our potatoes. We'll let these cook for three or four minutes. I'll kind of keep an eye on it. If it gets too hot, it's browning too fast, I'll turn it down. It is chicken. We want to make sure it's fully cooked all the way through. And then we'll come back, we'll make our sausage gravy, and then we'll see what Arthur thinks of our country fried. All right, so. Our chicken's in our warming oven. It came out beautiful. What I have in this pan here is I'm just finishing browning some pork sausage. It's just regular pork sausage, not Italian sausage. It's actually Jimmy Dean, the bulk sausage you can get in the package. It's good stuff. So I'm gonna let this cook and get just a little bit of brown on there. You can see if you look at the pan, there's a little bit, a very tiny little bit of fat in the pan. We're gonna make a roux again, so I'm gonna to need to add something else. So I'm gonna add a little bit of butter, but we're gonna wait just a moment to get it brown a little more. You can see some of these brown specks. <clears throat> the browner, the better. If it starts turning black, then it's gonna start getting bitter, that's burnt. All right, so I'm gonna add some butter to this. We'll let that melt right in. And this is one of my favorites. This is what I would, uh, this place I worked in Atlanta, another place where I used to sell a ton of chicken fried steak and chicken fried chicken. <clears throat> we'd make this same gravy and serve it over that, but we'd serve it over biscuits too, biscuits and gravy. Mm. All right, so now I'm gonna turn our heat way down on this and I'm gonna add flour. Once again, I'm gonna utilize the same flour that I breaded stuff in, so we're not, we're gonna end up throwing a little bit away, but we don't wanna waste much. So I've got a few tablespoons, and what we're looking for is for that just to pretty much absorb our uh, butter and the little bit of fat from the sausage. And we'll let this hang out and cook real slow. So next we're gonna make our mashed potatoes. All right, quick and easy. I'm gonna use a whisk, actually. You can use a potato masher if you have it. And I'm just gonna go through and beat up our potatoes a little bit. Now. Mashed potatoes are easy to make, but not a lot of people think them well, and I 
make them really well. And I think that's because they're afraid of fat. Mashed potatoes is not somewhere you want to be afraid of fat. So we're going to put a goodly amount of butter in there and let that melt. And we're going to add a pretty good amount of heavy cream to that too. And we're going to mix these around. And it's going to look a little soupy at first, as it does. But that's all right. And as we mix it, and I'm going to use, a, I have a fork here to scrape them out. So actually, it was that same place I worked in Dallas. The way we would always, didn't matter how many mashed potatoes we had to make, the chef made us mash them with a whisk because he wanted, he wanted there to be chunks. He didn't want it to be super uniform. So we were never allowed to use a mixer or a ricer or anything like that. So we always need salt and pepper. So I'll put some fresh ground black pepper and a pretty good, decent pinch of salt. Remember, we salted our water pretty liberally, so our potatoes are a little bit pre-salted. I'm going to just scrape a little potato out of the middle there again. And you know what? I'll taste a little bit. They're good, but they need a little bit more salt. I'll mix that in in a second. So over here, this is our sausage gravy. To this, I'm going to add, excuse me one second, let me grab my cream. I'm going to add this right to it. And I'm going to turn our heat back up and whisk this in. Now this is a little trick that might seem a little bit odd, but I found that I really liked this. It needs, it needs a little more salt, but I found that I loved it using a little bit of chicken base or chicken bouillon as my salt. Just added a little different taste to it, almost a little, just a hint of sweetness. So I have some chicken base here, so I'm going to put a little pinch of that in and just mix that around. So once again, as soon as this comes up to a full simmer, this is done. I'm going to add a little bit more milk to this, thin it down a little bit. Everything's ready. Let's get Arthur here and see what he thinks. Hey, Matt. Hey, Welcome Arthur. Welcome back to Hudson Flying's. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. Today, you're going to like this. Chicken fried. Ooh. So we've got chicken fried steak, which oh. I heard is one of your favorites, yep. with a country yes. gravy. So it's a really simple gravy made with the drippings that were left in the pan. Okay. Then we have mashed potatoes, oh. excellent mashed potatoes. But then we have chicken fried chicken, which not a lot of people up here at least know about, but it's fried chicken, but it's made in the same way as the steak. Okay. So it's a boneless, skinless chicken breast that's Beautiful fried. Color to it. Oh, and then this is a nice sausage gravy we're going to put on there. Okay. But let's give this a whirl. All right. I'll give you that piece there. Cut one for myself. Now it should be nice and tender. Oh, very tender. Hmm. That's really good. It came out great. Why don't you try the potatoes? And I'm going to put a little sauce on our chicken here for us to taste. Well, I love potatoes, and these are what I love. Yeah, I told them. I said, don't be afraid of adding fat. A lot of butter, a lot of cream in there. That's the way to go. <laughs> All right, so let me cut this chicken. We'll get a little piece there. So this is kind of the same gravy you'd put on like biscuits and gravy. Now what do you think? Now that's wicked, wicked good. good. 